Praise God. So far, we have learned four solas. Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone. Sola Gratia, grace alone. Sola Fide, Christ, faith alone. And Solus Christus, Christ alone. The basis of our salvation. We've been studying this because we are celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And the fifth solo that we have for us this morning is Soli Deo Gloria. Can you say that with me? Soli Deo Gloria. Glory to God alone. That's what it means. This final solo basically teaches us that because our salvation is entirely God's gift, therefore our life ultimately points to the praise and the glory of the one who saved us. To God alone be the glory. And our main scripture today is very simple. In fact, you can memorize it in three minutes. Romans chapter 11, verse 36. And I'd like for you to look at this and, and see, hey, I can actually memorize this. Very easy. Can we read it together? From, for from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's read that again. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. This verse gives us three very important lessons and realities. Number one, everything is from him. He made us. He is our creator. Say creator. Whenever I meet an atheist, they always try to make people who believe in God appear or sound dumb. Right? Have you ever had an encounter with, with people who don't believe in God and, and make you feel like you can't think for yourself and you do not have the intellectual capacity to actually come up with your own beliefs? See, they look at people of faith and, and think that we are idiots. <laughs> because we cannot think for ourselves. We just have decided to believe what we're told. But did you know that it takes more faith <laughs> to believe that there is no God than to believe that there is. Did you get that? It takes more faith to believe that there is no God than to believe that there is. Why? Because there are more proofs of the existence of God than there isn't. The reason I say this is because there are, like I said, more proofs to the existence of God in the form of intelligent design. See, the Big Bang Theory, I'm pretty sure you've heard that from high school and you still hear that around. That theory is premised on the idea that the universe was a result of a massive explosion, right? Which resulted in an orderly and complexly designed universe. How does that make sense to you? You cannot blow up a refrigerator and come up with a BMW. Right? So Big Bang doesn't result to, or any explosion doesn't result to order. If anything, it's disorder and destruction. Now, to me, like I said, that makes no sense. The late Sir Fred Hoyle of the British um, Academy of Zi Science, one of the best mathematicians who ever lived, said this very intriguing statement. As a mathematician and a scientist, he said, let's be scientifically honest with ourselves. A tornado blowing through a junkyard will not produce a Boeing 747. A tornado <laughs> cannot do that. Random and impersonal chance do not create complexity in design. Complexity and design are produced by intelligent designer. There is a story about the great scientist, Sir Isaac Newton, who built a perfectly scaled down replica of the then known solar system. A large golden ball represented the sun at the center and, and the known planets revolve around it through a series of cogs and belts and rods. It was an incredible machine. One day, while I, Sir Isaac Newton was studying his model, an atheist friend, friend stopped by for a visit, and, and this man marveled at the model that Newton built. His friend asked, who made this? This is exquisite. This is amazing. 
And without looking up, Newton just focused on what he was doing. He said, nobody, nobody built that, nobody. <laughs> That's right, Newton said. Really, nobody? Yeah, all these balls and cogs and belts and gears just happened to come together and wonder of wonders, they began to revolve. Newton made his point that day, but it, that, the people that still question intelligent design or still question the, uh, the existence of God are still fighting for um, what they believe in, despite the many proofs. And the reason why I'm not an atheist <laughs> is because I'm a pastor. No, not that. It's because everywhere I look, I see intelligence. The complexity of things, the organization that exists in this universe so overwhelmingly proves that there is an intelligent designer. And the Bible gives that designer a cre and creator a name. What's his name? Jesus. In fact, Colossians chapter 1 verses 16 to 17 tells us this. This is talking about Jesus. For in him... All things were made, were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Basically, that's just another way of saying, for from him and through him and for him are all things. Jesus is the power behind creation. Jesus put all of these things here. In fact, John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3 tells us this. In the beginning was the Word. Say the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning through Him, and this is proof to the Trinity. All things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made now, who is this word? Verse 14 tells us in the same chapter, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have, his, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Now, when God spoke, things came into being and that creative word that produced all things is Jesus, the same person who was born to Mary in Bethlehem more than 2,000 years ago. The same man who would eventually die on the cross. Why would he choose to die on the cross if he were God? Because humanity, the crown of his creation, chose to disobey him. We chose to distance ourselves from him. That rebellion, that distance broke the heart of our maker. And because he wants us to enjoy heaven with him, he left heaven and came to earth in the form of a man. To die on the cross for all of us. He didn't want to enjoy heaven for himself without us. Romans chapter 5, verses 6, verse 6 and 10b all the way to 11 says this. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. 10b says, our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son. While we were still sinners or enemies, we will we were certainly be saved through, um, here it is. We will certainly be saved through the life of his son. I love that. So now we can rejoice in a wonderful new relationship with God because Jesus, because of our Lord Jesus Christ who made us friends with God. By dying on the cross, he secured a place for us in heaven and made us new creation. Say new creation. He did not just make you, he has remade you. And I love that. Our salvation is actually very costly. It was worth the life of Jesus Christ himself. That is why the Bible tells us to honor God with our bodies, with our lives, because it has been bought with a price, a very high price. <laughs> Not only did he create me or made me or remade me, he also keeps me. Say, he keeps me. Where do we find that? We find that in that same verse. And through him, say through him. Colossians 1.17 says, He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All things hold together. What does that mean? Listen, Jesus preserves creation. He did not just make create, uh, the things that we see. He also preserves it. Even the things that we don't see. He is what, I would say, what keeps the molecular structure of this universe from going nuts. Every atom by nature would want to fly apart, but in God, he built 
this attraction that whole thing, holds things together in Jesus Christ. That means he preserves or sustains what he has created. Say preserved. What some people call the law of nature is actually the power of the Lord Jesus Christ holding things together. He guides the planets and the existence of the stars and the planets themselves declare the glory of God. Where we, what do we find that? Psalm 19. Can we read this together? Psalm 19, 1 to 4, it says together, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. The heavens declare the glory of God. You see, you look at the sky at night and you wonder how those stars stay in place. One word, Jesus. I was reading and listening to Naked Science one time and someone asked, a very curious mind, said, what would happen if the earth suddenly, or when the earth suddenly stopped orbiting? or if the earth strays from its orbit? The scientist answered, even a large asteroid collision would not lose enough mass to stop the earth from its orbit. There are no known planets ever losing orbit, ever. So planet, this planet earth is really safe from losing orbit. I know why. Because Jesus keeps it together. I love this verse in Job chapter 26, verse 7. It says, he spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. Unless you are David Blaine, that great magician who can make things suspend in midair, which is illusion, by the way. <laughs> but here we see I don't even know how massive the earth is. Like how, how much does the earth weigh? Do you know? Scientists can only actually guess. But how is he able to, spend, to suspend something as massive as the earth or the sun on nothing? And that's not, that's not all. Job 26, if you read that, let's read it together. Job 26, that continuing that, he say, it says, this is about God. Together, he wraps up the waters in his clouds, yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. He covers the face of the full moon, spreading his clouds over it. He marks out the horizon on the face of the waters for a boundary between light and darkness. The pillar of the heavens quake, aghast at his rebuke. By his power, he churned up the sea. By his wisdom, he cut Rahab to pieces. This is an, an animal. But his breath, the skies, by his breath, the skies became what? Fair. His fair, his hand pierced the gliding serpent. And these are but the outer fringe of his works. Can we read that again? And these are but the outer fringe of his work. How faint the whisper we hear of him. Who then can understand the thunder of his power? That last verse. Some of you might think, what does that even mean? The outer fringe of his works. What that means is, what you see around you and how the universe is held together is merely an iota, a minor expression of his power. That's what outer fringe means. And these are but the outer fringe of his works. How he manages to keep the universe intact. is nothing but an outer fringe of his power, an expression of it. That's how great God is. Are you following me or is this too much? If it's too much, then good. You know why? At least we understand and we realize God is beyond my mind. If, I, if, I will, if, if, there, if, if God is something that I could actually conceive and think of and contain in my mind, then he is not God. Because God is beyond your mind. But thank God for the Bible who actually, that actually reveals to us even a faint <laughs> revelation of who he is. But in John chapter 1 verse 14, which we read earlier, we read 
that in Jesus, this God who is in many ways unknowable has been made known in Jesus. So he is your sustainer. Say he is my sustainer. I love that. Sometimes we start something new with a real desire to see it through, right? But at times, as, as we progress, we start to lose interest in it. And we finally stop our involvement with it because our heart isn't in it anymore. But I'm glad, glad God is not like that. Our God is our great sustainer. What he creates or begins, he will sustain. Say sustain. I love what Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 and it talks about us, talks about our relationship with him and what he has begun in our life. It says that this God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it is finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. What he has begun in your life, he is committed to complete it. He sustains you, he preserves you, he's committed. He sustains and brings order into our lives, not just in this universe. I love Psalm 54, verse 4. It says, surely God is my help. Can you say that with me? Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Praise God for that. And 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 says this, and through faith, God is protecting you by his power. Say, say this with me. He is protecting me by his power. I love that. that. That is my God. That is your God. He's protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which means when you, until you get to heaven, he's going to keep you. He's going to protect you. So he did not only make you and remade you, he sustains you and preserves you. But also the verse in Romans says, we are for him. What does that mean? We exist for his purpose. He owns me. Say, he owns me. The universe came from him and is kept by his power, but it is also creation that culminates in him by grace. God's promise of eternal life in heaven is sure. We exist for him and he is our destiny. Can you say that with me? He is my destiny. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3b to 4 says this, Now we live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. What he has for you is something that will not be corrupted. And it's eternal for you, for you. Can you say that with me? It's for me. God has something for you. Now, what does that something or that future looks like? I don't really know. Even the Apostle Paul said this in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. It's going to be good. <laughs> it's going to be marvelous. He's not preparing something for, to you that will just, you know, when you get, we see it, oh, my expectations are not met. He will exceed it far greater. What does the future look like? I don't know, but it's got to be good. It's coming from God. Revelation chapter 7, and I love this. Somehow we are given a view or understanding of what the future might look like or will look like. Revelation 7 verses 9 to 12, and I love this part. This is John having a revelation of what God is going to be doing in the future. It says, after this, I looked. Who's this? John. And there before me was a great multitude, say multitude, that no one could count. From every, read this with me, every nation, tribe, people, and language. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice. Can you read this together with me? Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. 
Verse 11 says, all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. These are cryptic words, but they fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, let's see it together. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That's what your future looks like, y'all. In the presence of God. Saying, salvation belongs to our God. He is worthy of all praise. He is worthy of all glory. I have been saved for this. Hallelujah. And as long as he keeps you here on this earth, God wants you now to live out your destiny in him by bringing people to heaven with you, by sharing the gospel, by letting people know, hey, there is a better way of life. Life with Jesus. See, through us, he wants us to let as many people as we can to know the glorious salvation that he offers. So that when this future happens, <laughs> one of them will be your friends. Crying out with you, salvation belongs to our God. One of them will be your mother. One of them will be your dad. One of them will be your classmate. Salvation belongs to our God. While you are here on earth, our goal and our role is to live for his glory. We don't have to wait for that moment. We can do this now. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus said, In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will glorify your heavenly Father. It might be your family, maybe the people that you work with or go to school with. It might even be your neighbor, the neighbor that you don't like, or people you know on social media. Whoever they may be, let them know what God has done in your life. That salvation belongs to our God and that he is offering it to you and to me because you never know, something you might say to someone could be just what they need to hear today. So give yourself freely and unconditionally to the God who created you, to the God who sustains you, and to the God who owns you. It's the best and most fitting response to the grace that he has showered upon us. This is our God, the one who never withholds good things from his children. This is our great and almighty God. He not only keeps the universe in order, he also keeps our salvation secure for us. And while we wait for that day, he is committed to this. And as the team comes to lead us in a song, I'd like for us to remember these things that he is committed to do. Number one, he is committed to providing us with everything we need for life and godliness. Say this with me. He is committed to providing me with everything I need for life and godliness. See, I love this Psalm 37 verses 23 to 26. It says, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, who among you here made a mistake today or this past week? Though they stumble, they will never fall. <laughs> for the Lord upholds them by the hand. This is your God. You make mistakes, he will lift you up. He will not shove you down, he will lift you up. And he says in verse 25, once I was young, this is David speaking, and now I am old, yet I have never seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. Aren't you thankful? The godly always give generous loans to others and their children are a blessing. That's the promise of God to you. Philippians 4.19, Paul says, God shall supply all my needs. Can you say that with me? God shall supply. I love that. He's committed to providing you with everything you need for life and godliness. Another thing is he is committed to infuse you with courage so that you may boldly share his gospel with others. In fact, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 19, Paul says, Pray for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly, say fearlessly, make known the mystery of the gospel. What you have is given to you and the courage that you need is already there. It's just a matter of using it. 
Number three, he is committed to help you to be fruitful in his kingdom. Who among you here wants a fruitful life? All of us do. And you know what? He's committed to doing that to us. John chapter 16, verse 16 says, I chose you. Can you say that with me? God chose me. And he said, appointed you so that you may go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. And finally, your God is committed to give you grace to forgive every sin you will ever commit. This is your God. John, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, every time you make a mistake, he is faithful and just to forgive you of our sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. This is your God. He's not asking you to walk on your knees and pray some prayer many, many times. He just says, call on me and confess to me. And I'll give you a new start. I'll give you a fresh start. This is our God. <laughs> this is our God. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory. Glory to our God. This is our God. He made us. He saved us. He keeps us and he owns us. This is our God. He is our destiny and our joy. This is our God. And because we came from him and we live through him, we exist for him, we choose to give him glory alone forever. This is our God. He is worthy of our praise. Stand to your feet. Let's give him praise. This is Jesus, the word from the very beginning. The power and the person that created the universe and keeps it together. This is our God. And in his great mercy, he came and died for our sins. This is our God. He has given us a new start, a new family, a new beginning, a new life. This is our God. And this God, Jesus, is given the name that is above every name. And that at that name, every knee will bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. They will declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is our God. This is our God. He is my maker. Say this with me. He is my maker. He is my owner. He's my savior, my master, and my destiny. He is our God. His name is Jesus. Jesus means the Lord saves. That's what his name means. Some people may use his name as a swear word, but I'm not bothered by that because I know what that means. And I am saved in that name. This is my God. I know how powerful it is. And that at the mention of his name, name demons tremble, sicknesses flee in the name of Jesus. This is our God. Oh, glory and honor to him. This is our God, Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. He is Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and my eternity. In Him, say in Him, every promise of God to me is a yes and amen. This is my God. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. Oh, we praise you, Jesus. From the very beginning of time, you have had us in your mind <laughs> so that we may enjoy the glory of your presence. We exist for your glory. Oh, we thank you, Lord.